This morning, I've already told you, we're continuing to look at Luke's gospel, and we come now to that passage having to do with Jesus being entertained by Martha and Mary in Martha's house, and again, the, uh, the different reactions, the different responses to our Lord's being there. Both of these sisters doing something that was good, but one doing something that was better. So let's take a look at that in uh, Luke chapter 10. Verses 38 through 42. I'm going to go ahead and read the text and then we'll take a look at it. Luke writes, Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord... Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, Luke tells us that after Jesus' encounter with the lawyer, remember the, uh, the lawyer asking Jesus about what is, or really what he needed to do to enter into the kingdom of heaven and what he needed to do was to love the Lord his God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love his neighbor as himself. And passing over the greater commandment, the greater of the two, he goes to the second. He says, who is my neighbor? Hoping to justify himself. And Jesus gave him the parable of the Good Samaritan. Your neighbor is everyone. Your neighbors, particularly those who are in need, even your enemy. And Jesus said at the end of that, you need to show mercy. Go and do likewise. Show mercy to all your neighbors. Our Lord Jesus was teaching us that mercy triumphs over justice. And though there are many times when we might desire to um, get even with those who might injure us with our enemies, the Lord tells us we need to show mercy. Well, again, I wanted us to be reminded of that because that perhaps is the most difficult thing that our Lord calls us to do. But the thing that our Lord did the most and that stands out about his character, that reflects what it is he wants us to reflect. Well, after this encounter with the lawyer, he continues toward Jerusalem. Remember, we read earlier the days of his ascension were drawing near when he would give his life for us, be raised from the dead, and then ascend into heaven to be crowned king over all. And so Jesus, at this point in his ministry, was determined to go to Jerusalem because, as he will tell us later in this gospel, in Luke 13, verse 33, it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. Well, on the way, he entered into a village. Luke doesn't tell us here, but this village was Bethany, about two miles east of Jerusalem. Interestingly, I thought this was kind of an interesting note, uh, Bethany, the, the road between Bethany and Jerusalem is really the road to Jericho, which is the one that's right on the border, the, the city that was on the border there of the Promised Land. Uh, but it's also where Jesus set the parable of the Good Samaritan. The man was on the road, remember, to, to Jericho. So perhaps it was because Jesus was on that road when the question was asked, but this was also the place that Jesus would frequent during his last week on earth before his death. He, would, he came into Jerusalem, but he would leave Jerusalem to go back to Bethany. Now, one of the reasons why he would go to Bethany was there, a, there was a family there that was particularly precious to him, the family of Martha, Mary, and even though he's not named here, Lazarus. Now, we do know that Jesus loves Everyone that the Father gives to him, all who belong to him. The Lord loves you if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and serving him as your Lord. But we also know that Jesus had his favorites. You know, sometimes there are those who were singled out. Remember how Jesus had his inner circle you know, of, of the three, Peter, James, and John, that he would take with him on, you know, to the Mount of Transfiguration or perhaps into the Garden to pray. John is singled out as that disciple whom Jesus loved. And we do see that um, this particular family is also singled out. John tells us in John 11, verse 5, that Jesus loved Martha 
and her sister and Lazarus. So Jesus again was coming into this village to see them and of course also uh, to be welcomed by them. And he was not disappointed when he arrived. Martha welcomed him and his disciples into her home. We do need to remember that our Lord Jesus <clears throat> really had no earthly possessions to speak of. He virtually had just the uh, clothes that were on his back, perhaps the staff that was in his hand. Son of God who was rich, the one who was uh, really the possessor of all creation, we read in Scripture, became poor so that through his poverty we might become rich. But also because of his poverty and because of his vocation, he was completely dependent on his friends to provide for him. Remember what uh, Paul said to Timothy and it's repeated also by Luke, um, the laborer is worthy of his wages. Jesus gave himself to full-time ministry. He spent all of his time in either in prayer, in discipling his disciples, in preaching the gospel, in doing the miracles that were necessary to vindicate the gospel that he was preaching. He didn't have time for a vocation that would provide for his needs, so he was dependent upon others to provide those needs. And Martha would be that particular one on this occasion. But now it's here that Martha while ministering to the Lord in his particular needs, will learn a valuable lesson for herself on what really is the most important thing in life. And what I want us to do is look at two things from this passage. First of all, the contrast between these two sisters, Mary's, uh, excuse me, Martha's busyness and Mary's devotion. And then secondly, which Jesus considered to be the most important between the two. Now, first of all, we need to understand that what Martha did here, she was doing because she loved Jesus. Remember, love moves us to serve those that we love. But I think we also need to see that Martha did this because she sensed the responsibility that was particularly hers as the head of this, this household. Now, it's interesting that Luke, you know, Luke is the one that I'm sure you've heard this before, focuses on the women in Jesus' life and how important they were to his ministry. And it's interesting here what Luke writes in Luke 10, verse 38, that Martha welcomed him, that is Jesus, into her home. Okay? It appears that she was the head of this house. Many believe that she was likely married and that she had become a widow. And we also see that she was a woman of some means. She may not have been rich, but at least she did have what she needed to provide for her sister Mary and for her brother Lazarus, who didn't seem to enjoy particularly good health. Remember, he was the one who died on one occasion that our Lord Jesus raised again to life. And she often welcomed our Lord into her house and the disciples. Now, taking care of all these people, entertaining all these people would have been very expensive, which means that she, uh, she did have the ability at least to be able to do this. And when you stop and think about it, what better way is there to spend what it is the Lord gives to you and to me than for his cause? To spend our resources, right? And to spend our strength. We're going to see Mary expending a great deal of energy trying to take care of the Lord. You know, that's what our Lord wants us to do as stewards of what he's given to us. He wants us to support his cause. He wants us to serve him in the work of his kingdom. Now, the love that she had for our Lord Jesus, I believe, becomes even more obvious when you consider how close she lived to that city that housed most of Jesus' enemies. You know, he was welcomed just about everywhere in Palestine except for the one city, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And remember, Jerusalem is only two miles off. There were many Jews there who wanted to kill Jesus. Now, you might think that Bethany being two miles away and being a, a town, that Jesus might be able to hide himself there. But it's believed that Bethany was actually quite small at this time, that there might have been as few as only 20 families living there. It would be hard to hide the fact that Jesus was visiting but you see, when you love the Lord, you also trust the Lord. And you're not afraid to love him openly, right? Because we know, I believe Martha knew, that ultimately her life 
was in the Lord's hands, that nobody could really take it away from her unless it was in God's plan. And we need to realize that as well, don't we? That we can openly love the Lord in the midst of a society of people who hate him, knowing that really nothing's going to happen to us outside of the will of God. This is what our Lord wants us to do, to let our light shine before men in such a way that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Now, wanting to serve her Lord and feeling the responsibility to provide for her guests, Martha immediately went to work. You know, it's quite likely that this was a surprise visit. I mean, how's Jesus going to let, you know, Mary or Martha know that he's on his way there? They couldn't text in those days. They didn't have a phone. So it may have caught her by surprise. There was a lot of work to do to be able to provide for this large of a crowd. But Mary, on the other hand, decided to do something very different. Shortly after Jesus entered, he began to do what he would normally do when he entered into a house. He would begin to teach those who were there. And Mary sat at his feet, as likely the rest of the disciples did as well, to listen to him. Now, what Mary was doing was what a disciple would do in those days in order to learn from the master. The, the student would sit at the master's feet to pay careful attention to what it is he had to teach. Now, Paul, on one occasion, said to those Jews at Jerusalem when he was uh, arrested by them as he was, again, beginning to head towards Rome, when he was arrested at the temple, this is what he said regarding his own training. In Acts 22, verse 3, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. Now, the translators have done us a favor here, and they translated the phrase uh, that, well, the, the phrase that they translated under Gamaliel uh, to something we can understand, but literally in the Greek, it, it's translated this way, he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel because Gamaliel was the master and Paul was the disciple. A.T. Robertson, the 20th century Greek scholar, writes this about this passage. The rabbis usually sat on a raised seat with the pupils in a circle around either on lower seats or on the ground. Paul was thus nourished in Pharisaic Judaism as interpreted by Gamaliel, one of the lights of Judaism. So essentially, we see Martha getting busy to take care of the physical needs of our Lord Jesus, which were important. But Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus in order to learn. Now the question is, which of these two did Jesus prefer? Which of these two did he approve of? Well, we see this. Martha got frustrated. She was doing all the work. Mary was just sitting there. You know, again, she had a lot to do because she didn't know that Jesus was coming, didn't have time to prepare. She got so frustrated that she came to Jesus and she said this in verse 40, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. Now, of course, you know, we've never felt like this. We've never been in a situation where we're doing all the work and we see other people just sitting around not doing the work, nobody else seeming willing to help. I think we can relate to what Martha was going through. You know, we can just see Martha looking at Mary. You know, as Mary's sitting there, she's doing all the work, trying to catch her eye so that she can gesture to her, you know, come, come and help me. You know, get up and get busy. But you know what? Mary never seemed to take her eyes off of Jesus. So Martha turns her attention to Jesus. Surely Jesus understands what she's going through. He knows that she's right. He should be telling Mary to get to work and to help her. I mean, doesn't Jesus care? Well, you know, it's not really too uncommon, is it? When you are doing the right thing, such as what Mary was doing, you know, listening to Jesus, that's what Martha should have been doing. And of course, what Jesus was doing all the time, to be censured, to be criticized by those who aren't doing the right thing, which is what Martha was doing. I mean, again, this happened to Jesus all the time. But we do need to realize that just because somebody gets angry at us or complains about what we're doing or not doing, it doesn't mean that we're 
you know, doing or not doing, I should say we're not doing the right thing or we're doing the wrong thing. Um, remember the occasion when Michal, you know, Michael, uh, Saul's daughter, don't like to say Michael, that sounds like a man's name, but it's really Michal is, is how it's uh, in, in the Hebrew, said to David, remember when he was dancing before the ark of God as it was being brought into Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 6.20, how the king of Israel distinguished himself today. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servants' maids as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. David was doing the right thing. What he was doing was honoring to God. But he was being criticized for it because of the bitterness that was in her heart. And I think we have a little bit of that going on here with Martha, don't we? She was getting angry at Mary, becoming perhaps a little bit bitter over the fact that she wasn't chipping in to help. And so how does Jesus respond to Martha? Well, she expected that he was going to back her up, but he took Mary's side instead, and he reproved her. Now, notice that our Lord Jesus did it in a very gracious way, and I think we need to learn from this if we're going to try to help somebody as well, because whenever Jesus reproves whenever Jesus, you know, corrects. He always does it with a good motive, obviously a perfect motive, out of love because he wants that person to experience his blessing, to do better. The author to the Hebrews tells us that those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And so here we see Jesus disciplining Martha. First of all, he says, Martha, Martha. You know, he calls her by name and he repeats it twice. And this is really a Jewish way of expressing friendship, closeness, care, and concern. So first of all, he reaches out to her in friendship and love. Secondly, he corrected her only for the things she was doing wrong. I mean, what she was doing was not wrong. He didn't just dismiss what she did completely out of hand, as it were, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Because what she was doing was good, she was meeting a need. And she was doing it from a good motive. I mean, she really did love the Lord. The problem, though, was, was, was twofold. First of all, she was anxious. She was worried that things weren't happening fast enough and that the needs weren't going to be met, and maybe she was worried about how that was going to look. How was that going to reflect upon her? Paul writes this in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So she's getting frustrated. She's getting anxious. She's, she's worried. And such worry is really sin. So Jesus is first of all saying, you know, you need to calm down and not get worried about this. You're not doing this in, in a peaceful way. But more seriously, she was bothered. Now, bothered here does not mean that she was getting angry, but it means that she was distracted. You know, you're, you're distracted by so many things. Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted about so many things. But only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Her work was distracting her from something that was far more important than the work that she was doing. Now, what is this one thing that is necessary? You know, it's interesting, some commentators thought that Jesus was reproving Martha for doing more than she needed to do, for preparing many dishes of food when she really just needed to prepare one. Only one is really necessary. But that's not what the Lord was talking about. What he was actually saying to Martha was that Martha, instead of preparing that food, you need to be sitting at my feet, just like Mary is, listening to my word. Remember what Jesus said in our meditation in Matthew 4, verse 4? Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, we do need bread. We do need food. But Jesus is telling us here there's something we need even more than that. We need God's Word. We need it more so that we might know how to live for His glory, so that we might know our Savior, so that we might know our Heavenly Father. 
Remember what our Lord Jesus Christ said on one occasion to his disciples when they brought food for him uh, out of the city in Samaria? He said in John 4, verse 34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now, too often I think we, we get things turned around. You know, we want to eat first, like Martha, and then, you know, providing everything we need first, once we've got everything we think we need, then we turn to God's will. Then we begin to do His will. But let's not forget what our Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew 6.33. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We need to put the kingdom of heaven first, you see, just like Jesus did in Samaria. You know, why didn't he take that food? Well, because he had already eaten, as I said before, but, you know, from the hidden manna, that which is more satisfying, uh, knowing God's will and doing it is actually more satisfying than food. Now, it's not going to replace food altogether. We understand that. But it is to be a priority. So Martha reproved Mary for not following her example, and he wanted Jesus to reprove her as well. But Jesus reproved Martha for not following Mary's example. Mary had chosen the good part. She had done the one thing necessary, which is to sit at Jesus' feet, to listen to his teaching so that she may learn how to be godly, how to be like Jesus. You know, there would be time to prepare and eat later. Paul writes to Timothy that godliness is really the only thing that will benefit us not only in this life, but in the life that is to come. And that's what Mary was doing, learning how she might be more godly. It leads to a closer relationship with the Lord. It leads to a more fruitful life. It leads to blessings in heaven. You know, that we, we're, Jesus told us on one occasion that we are to store up our treasures in heaven, not upon the earth. Treasures which he says no one will ever take away from us. Mary has chosen the good part, and it will never be taken away from her. So what is Jesus telling us to do here? Well, he's telling us to make him and his kingdom our priority. We need to identify the, the busy things that we are doing in our lives, maybe even the busy things we're doing, thinking that we're serving the Lord, that are actually getting in the way of our devotion to him. And we need to put those things to one side and put him first by spending time with him, sitting at his feet every day in prayer, in Bible reading, and every Lord's Day when he calls us to meet together with him. Now, we do know that as we do this and as we, we become more godly and we begin doing more of the right things and as we love the Lord openly, even as Martha was willing to do, and certainly Mary and Lazarus, <clears throat> there will be those who will criticize us for doing this, the way that Martha criticized Mary, the way that <clears throat> excuse me, the Jews would do to Martha if they knew that she had Jesus in her home. The, um, <clears throat> you know, there are people who are going to be criticizing us, but we need to understand the Lord will support us. The Lord will be there for us. The Lord will love us. The Lord will stand up for us and he will protect us in the same way that he stood up for Mary. And he will also assure us that nothing in heaven or earth will ever be able to take away the blessings that we gain for trusting in him and following him and serving him in the way that he calls us to serve. So may the Lord help us through this example to be able to get our lives into better priority so that we might better serve and honor our Lord. And may he give us grace also to trust him that he will support us if we will do this and he will stand up for us because he loves us. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to, um, to help us apply this to our lives.